Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our fourth WIC Talks. I have said this before and I say it again. That the goal of WIC Talks when we introduce WIC Talks is to connect people from this community, from Dehradun, from Uttarakhand, who have worked selflessly in various fields and achieved success. And not just personal success, but success for the mission that they have pioneered. And to connect these people with, with the living community of Dehradun. When I first came to Dehradun and uh, was exploring avenues for art or music, or you know, anything cultural, I, I remember that the only thing that popped up <laughs> was that of Lokesh Ori, and I think several people resonated with that, that he was really the, the founding um, father, <laughs> the, founding, the founding person, a person who really instilled the idea of culture in a community that was that was slow and sleepy and tired and somehow underground here. Yeah. So, and you kept it alive and you brought it to life here. Yeah. And hence, uh, we're immensely proud to have Lakesh here and to have Lakesh address everyone, this community, in a very personal way. Because when, when we discussed the topic, uh, Lakesh said, what should I talk about? I said uh, that the goal is not to talk about on a subject or uh, a part of the study, but to talk about himself and his journey, his journey in anthropology, his journey with heritage, how he became the heritage activist, the heritage lover that he is today, and hence the title, Heritage in Me. I now request Lakesh to address everyone on Heritage in Me. Over to you, Lakesh. Thank you uh, very much. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and what a pleasure it is to be here at WIC. Uh, we've seen WIC uh, blossom into this uh, center for the arts and for culture and for people who are interested in uh, intellectual inputs. And uh, for me, it's a great luxury to be here uh, talking to an audience uh, many of whom I know very intimately uh, and talking to people about my journey with heritage and my journey with anthropology. Yeah, uh, the journey has been very eventful and, um, and I, I guess I have learned a lot from uh, many people that I met uh, during this journey. So. Uh, well, to talk about my journey, uh, I will start with my school days in Dehradun uh, when I was a student at St. Joseph's Academy. And uh, probably twice in my life, good marks came in the way of what I wanted. Uh, so they interfered with uh, my game plan. I wanted to be an artist, I wanted to be a painter. But unfortunately, I had good marks in class 10 and then I was forced into science. Um, I had a very tough time doing science, uh, and uh, but then there came a time when the principal called me into his office and he said, Lokesh, are you going to pass the exam? Uh, we don't want to spoil our school's results. Uh, you, you don't seem to be studying too well. So that was the day when I started working hard and unfortunately again got good marks in class 12. Um, but this time I had decided to, uh, to go into the arts, so I uh, got into uh, the Delhi College of Art. I wanted to be a painter, but all my friends said, Are you a painter or no? Um, you will struggle <laughs> all your life and why do you want to do this? So uh, peer pressure, parental pressure, friends, everyone came together and I ended up taking commerce. I studied commerce for some time, did management, went into the corporate world, but was never happy with what I was doing. Uh, the unfortunate part was that none of my teachers, none of my elders could uh, really tell me what I was supposed to do. And, um, and it was much later in life that I realized uh, that art and culture was my calling. 
So uh, when I came back to Dehradun, I was quite disillusioned. I had nothing much to do. Uh, but while I was here, I kind of drifted into uh, art and culture because there was this group called Fitmeke that was doing uh, programs for schools and colleges and uh, gradually rose up in the hierarchy in Spitmate and became the national executive uh, head. So I was traveling all over the country, uh, meeting young people, doing, uh, doing these concerts and events at uh, various uh, places across the country, traveling with artists. So Spitmate gave me the opportunity to travel with greats like Mustafis Mila Khan and Pandit Bhimse Joshi. So we were normally traveling in, uh, you know, first class tier compartments with these greats and the journeys would take two days, three days, like traveling to Guwahati or traveling from Delhi to Chennai. Uh, but it was a great learning experience. I got to see India and I got to be in the company of these people, uh, which was, I think, uh, which took me up the learning curve a lot. I think I learned the most in those seven, eight years, uh, seven, eight years uh, that I worked with Spit uh, which gave me the confidence to come back to Dehradun and start my own uh, NGO called Reach. Uh, so we were seven or eight friends. We got together and started this organization called Reach. The idea was rural entrepreneurship that the villages they have to be made so they have to be made important and it is from the villages that the entrepreneurship should come in in the fields of art and culture so reach stood for rural entrepreneurship for art and cultural heritage and that was the idea that we worked with the classical tradition a lot we have worked with the mainstream traditions now let's look at folk music let's look at folk culture and uh, so I guess my journey into anthropology was, uh, it was uh, a given once I started working in art and culture full time. And, uh, and the, you know, the journey into anthropology is also very interesting, if I can narrate a little anecdote. Uh, so uh, there was this guy called uh, uh, Professor William Sachs who is uh, globally considered as the expert on Garhwala. And I met him uh, in Sri Garhwala during one of my travels. We started talking about his work and I found it quite interesting. Before that, I had no clue what anthropology meant. As I'm sure a lot of you <laughs> don't have a clue about what anthropology is. But uh, Professor Sachs was a great Anthropologist, and I found his work very interesting. Um, and uh, he said, Do you know someone in the chief minister's office? Uh, so I said, Yeah, I know some people in uh, CM Andy Tiwari's office. Uh, and uh, he said, I would like to meet him. So we fixed an appointment and we went into the secretary. Of course, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, CM Saab made us wait for us outside his office. Uh, we went at the appointed time, but the other meeting scheduled, the delegation came in with lots of bouquets and stuff. So me and Sachs, we were sitting in the reception uh, talking about my work for two hours. So it was providential, it was uh, like um, a gift from God that I could talk to Dr. Sachs for two hours uh, and he said, why don't you write a proposal? So I went back home and started writing a proposal uh, and he invited me to Germany to present the proposal. It didn't work. So we got rejected. Uh, even though I made the effort of writing and traveling all the way to uh, Heidelberg, uh, in the first instance, it did not work, but in the second instance, he said, okay, now I'll write the proposal. You write the proposal, but I'll present it myself. I won't ask you to come all the way, uh, but we must do something together. So the second time we uh, gave a proposal, uh, that proposal got accepted. Very, I was very fortunate that I got the opportunity to work 
uh, in the Himalayas around Peratma for my uh, doctoral studies and, uh, and even more fortunate that uh, Professor Sachs was my guide, he was my supervisor. In, in Germany they describe it as the doctor father, the doctor father they call it. So he was my doctor father for the, for the doc doctoral studies and uh, again it was such a great learning experience working with him and uh, looking at the library of the South Asia Institute. It gave, gave me a completely different perspective on education and how these universities are looking at India and looking at South Asia and uh, why, why are they interested in studying South Asia so much. So I think that's how the whole thing uh, went. Um, so uh, my doctoral studies are based on this region called the John Sar Bawa, which most people in Dehradun, it's just a few hundred kilometers away and most of us think of it in terms of a tribal region because they are a scheduled tribe according to the Indian constitution. Uh, but it's, it's fascinating to see how much uh, we in Dehradun are influenced by what's happening in John Sar. And uh, it's also fascinating that a few hundred kilometers from where we are sitting right now, there is a, there is a social group that, has, uh, that is ruled by divine kings. They have their own system of divine kingship. Um, and even though we have democracy, we, even though we are supposed to be modern and we have internet and WhatsApp and whatever, um, the society runs very, very traditionally uh, with, uh, with the divine kings calling the shots most of the time. So that was a social group that I got to learn more about. I was fortunate to learn the dialects. I was fortunate to live with uh, so many families in Jonsa. And I realized that uh, that it's a, it's a completely different world, even though it is so close to where we are. And uh, so I was uh, traveling with, uh, with these divine kings. So the, these divine kings is, you know, uh, very difficult for people sitting here in, in, in this audience to comprehend that they are idols, they are statues. And uh, one of the statues is called Mahasu. And Mahasu are the four brothers. They are, so it's a very, uh, you know, a different take on kingship. So anthropology looks at South Asian kingship. There is a term called South Asian kingship. And South Asian kings are supposed to have certain characteristics. Like they're supposed to have a fort, they're supposed to have a treasure, they're supposed to have ministers, they're supposed to have a, a bureaucracy. Mm. So seven or eight characteristics which worldwide are accepted, which were given by Patilya uh, in his Arthashastra that if a person is a Raja, he has to have these attributes. So, uh, Mahasu has all these attributes, but he's not a human, he's, a, he's an idol placed inside a temple and then the idol is taken out periodically and uh, taken around the kingdom in a procession. So there are Mahasu processions crisscrossing all over the place and when I began my research I thought I was going into this little village uh, by the towns uh, in, a, in a remote area in Uttarakhand. But then I realized that Mahasu kingdom is, is, it extends all the way up to Simla. In fact the district Simla before the British named it Simla uh, was called uh, district Mahasu. So, uh, so Mahasu is this big Raja who rules over the entire kingdom. Uh, his capital is at Hanol, which is very close to Dehradun, about 180 odd kilometers away. So we travel uh, 200 kilometers down the road and we are in Delhi. And then we travel 180 kilometers up the road and we are in Hanol. So we know a lot about Delhi. But we know very little about, Mah about Mahasu, who is part of our district. And uh, yeah, so uh, very interesting insights I got in my research. 
uh, especially the insights, because my research was based on political rituals. And uh, so I got to read a lot of these documents. Uh, the British have done a really good job of preserving these documents in the British Library in London. So the documents were not available in the National Archives. They were not available in the State Archives. This documentation of how the British dealt with this abstract thing uh, were available there. So when they came into this region in 1815-1816, after the anglo gurkha War, uh, they had things to deal with, like they had a Tiri Raja, they had the Raja of Chupad, they had the Raja of Rampur Bashar. These were little kingdoms in the mountains. Uh, so they could, you know, identify with the kings, they could deal with them. But how do you deal with an abstract king who is just an idol? And the idol is also kept secret most of the time. It's never shown to people. Most of the people, the priests who work with Mahasu, who look after him day and night, uh, they have never seen that. So it's very secretive. And then these, uh, you have these British officers who come with the ICS training. How do they deal with this abstract thing? So, which, which was a very fascinating uh, idea. Yes, it's 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 a very powerful uh, political uh, figure uh, because even today, when you when the uh, parliament election is announced, when the Vidhan Sabha election is announced, uh, Mahasu chooses the candidates. His oracles they sit down. So Mahasu speaks through oracles. He speaks through people who are called Malis. Malis get possessed by the divine king. And they pronounce the judgments. If there is a case, if there is a you know dispute between two parties, the oracles pronounce judgment. So it's the king pronouncing judgment. And they would say that so and so can contest and I support so and so. And that person would definitely win the election. So it's a very, very uh, strong political presence. And I got the perspective of two officers almost a century apart. Both of these officers wrote their diaries. Frederick Young was the first one. He wrote his dispatches very meticulously every day. He would sit down and write his dispatch. Today this has happened in Dehradun. So he was the British agent, first British agent in the Dole Valley and uh, he was writing his dispatches uh, and, and the manner in which he was relating to Mahasu. There was also an instance where he was trying to settle a land dispute which people would not agree to and finally he said, okay, four years I have heard this case, now let's go to the Mahasu temple in Hanol and let Mahasu decide uh, about it was a very important case between the Raja of Tehri and the chiefs of Ramayan. So they were quarreling over some land and uh, Major Young said, I can't decide this case, but let Mahasu decide the case. So that was one aspect. And then there was uh, another officer called Emerson, who was the governor of the Shimla Hill States, who was also writing his diaries. So Young was writing his diaries in 1815, uh, which was immediately after the British came to the Doom Valley. And Emerson was writing his diaries in 1911, so almost a century after, after Young came here. And uh, he also had his run-ins with Mars. So he was more skeptic, he was more modern in his approach, he was more scientific in his approach. Uh, and he said it was blind superstition and but then he also had some extraordinary experiences with Mahasu which he also documented in his diary and a lot of the times he uh, he did not agree with Mahasu but some of the times he did agree with uh, with a supernatural presence uh, in, in, the, in the mountains. So there are so many cases like these. I have read about uh, Commissioner Trey, who was the commissioner in Kumau Hills, uh, who went blind when he decided to shift the Nanda Devi temple. So uh, 
That's what anthropology is. It's a kind of bridge between uh, the applied sciences, as we look at the sciences, but it also gives us a perspective on what we describe as alternative cosmologies. In India, unfortunately, anthropology is treated as humanities, as arts, but all over Europe and, and the Americas, it is treated as science. And, uh, and of course, the applied sciences like physics or chemistry or astrophysics, uh, they are very well funded. They have, they have lots of money, they have laboratories, they have uh, you know, the elaborate research uh, uh, material to prove what's happening uh, in the applied sciences. But in anthropology and the humanities, they are not that well funded in terms of um, you know, international grants. And yet, uh, we are also, through, these, through the science of anthropology, we are able to look at these um, alternative ways of looking at the world. That there is not just one world that we exist in, but there are several other worlds also, uh, and, and ways of looking at the world that we need to consider. So I guess I think that's a bit of an overdose of anthropology. <laughs> Plenty of questions popping in mind, and I'm sure there are many also in the heads of the audiences here. Um, but the, the first thing I want to ask you is, you said the, the term heritage, how do people really understand the term heritage? So how would you define the understanding of the term heritage in, in our country, or in our culture, more specifically? Yeah, I would look at heritage as uh, uh, not everything that we have inherited from our past is of value. We, we cannot say that, uh, that everything that our ancestors have given to us must be preserved. Like for instance, we don't absolutely need to protect the caste system. We don't need to uh, defend uh, practices like dowry. So these are things that we have inherited from the past. We don't need to preserve them. But then there are also several things of great value that our ancestors have uh, left for us and they definitely need to be preserved. Generally when we talk about heritage in India, we talk about it in terms of buildings, we talk about it in terms of styles, of works of art, but heritage is everywhere, it pervades everything. I think uh, the, the stories that our grandmothers told us uh, are very much a part of heritage. Uh, the way our civilization looked at trees, the way our civilization looked at the environment, you know, our folk songs, our motifs that we painted on the walls inside the huts, they are all very much a part of heritage and we need to be informed about it. We, we, I mean, before we think of conserving and protecting, uh, we need to understand them. And uh, because we have so much, because we are such a traditional uh, ancient society, that I think we have a problem of plenty. We have so much uh, that we have stopped valuing it. So uh, we need to understand these things first, that what is heritage, what is significant, what is not significant, and then start working towards conservation. I'm, uh, I mean, and we need to be very acutely aware that we cannot preserve everything. We cannot conserve everything that is around. But with things that are of very high value, we must make an effort to conserve them. Do you, do you see a, a shift in the post-independence India and the pre-independence India on how this conservation or this awareness self-perpetrated? Was, has there been a system of self-perpetration of heritage, you know? And has there been a shift? Oh yes, uh, there have been multiple shifts. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, 
The colonial rule uh, gave us a sense of inferiority. Definitely, it gave us, gave us a very uh, bad sense of inferiority that perhaps we were lacking in some ways in, in comparison to the Western civilization. And then there were several British officers, there were several colonial uh, officers who came to India and, and found a new respect for whatever was heritage in India. In India. And, um, and we must appreciate the efforts of some of these people who really worked towards preserving a lot of the heritage that we had. But for their efforts we would have lost a lot of the treasures that still survived. And uh, post-independence, initially there was a very strong sense of inferiority, um, but gradually I guess we realized the inherent value and the values that were present in our civilization and started working towards preserving them. But of course there have been you know, ups and downs, there have been shifts. Um, some of the efforts, like for instance the founding of INTAC, I think that was a major, major achievement because on the one hand we had this uh, organization which was set up by the British, it was called the Archaeological Survey. So most people assume that Archaeological Survey has, uh, has the task of preserving our heritage. But ASI has a very limited mandate, they have a very limited task. They are archaeology experts. So their expertise is archaeology, and archaeology means in, in, uh, something that is old and uh, old civilizations, and then leaving it for historians to interpret. So archaeology is a limited field if you compare it with conservation. Conservation is a very very wide field, and emerged as. Uh, uh, outside of the government intervention field. So intact developed its own expertise because for a country like India which has so much diversity, uh, you have a very, uh, a very wide field of expertise. So, but intact did that on the basis of voluntary efforts like me and several others across the country. Uh, they, they did develop the expertise in conservation. So, uh, in fact, became a major force. Uh, of course, it was Indira Gandhi's initiative. And uh, a lot of uh, people who were working in the field, they rallied around her. And only she had the vision and she, she had the, you know, to give it the power punch so that in fact it became a reality. Uh, so we've had our highs and we've had our lows. We've, we've done uh, much harm to heritage, uh, but there have been a few successes as well. When you started uh, your work in Dehradun, in Uttarakhand, what were some of your key challenges? Did you have challenges from the communities that you worked in, from the government, also from people, general people, you know, just the general community itself? How was it received? How was it well received? So when you ask this question, you know, I'm reminded of uh, a time when I went to the Secretariat and uh, I met this uh, Chief Secretary who was, uh, of course I won't name him, but he was, um, he was considered to be quite a learned person. And, and I met him and uh, the first question he asked me was, you work in Dehradun, uh, does Dehradun have any heritage? Uh, I don't think it has any heritage. People don't know about any heritage in Dehradun. I've been trying to find some heritage here. Yeah. So, uh, that was a key challenge, you know. People did not think of Dehradun as a town that had some kind of heritage. And to people at that stage, I think the biggest challenges came when the new state came into being. Uh, so, People could not think of a canal heritage. They thought it, it's just a canal, it's just a water body. Um, what does it have to do with heritage? They could not think of Ashley Hall as heritage. They thought it's just a marketplace. 
And why this happened was because most of the heritage that we had in the city was not interpreted. It was not uh, documented, no one talked about it as heritage, and citizens didn't seem to love it. So I think these two things are very key, that if, if you have something of heritage value, one, it has to be interpreted. You have to document it scientifically, you have to give a date to it, you have to say, this is the heritage value. To me, if, if a tree is years old, uh, someone would say, oh, it's just a 40-year-old tree. Uh, but to me, it is heritage, it's precious heritage. And if I can also say that, oh, Mahatma Gandhi planted it, then it becomes even more precious. So, there were lots of these things in the Ladun which were not documented due to the lack of documentation, due to the lack of interpretation. Uh, they were not considered heritage. Like for instance, when the canal, when the EC road, and the Rajpur road canal was being covered for road widening, I went up to the High Court in Nerikal and filed a BIA. And uh, on the dais was a South Indian gentleman who was a judge. He picked up my petition and threw it like this. And he threw it out of the, I mean, threw it on the floor and said that uh, you guys, you are anti-development. You are trying to stop the work of the government and I will not allow this obstruction of the government's work. So, I mean, it did make news. <laughs> the canal got covered, no one bothered about it. Uh, I wrote several letters to people and uh, in the end it came to nothing. So, there were very big challenges because uh, the heritage we had was not interpreted, it was not documented, who the citizens didn't, didn't seem to care about. It. Now we have a movement, now we have people who talk about it um, and who seem to love their heritage and would rally together, would come together. Uh, like you see the Rajpur Road, uh, which is being uh, refurbished. The, uh, cobbled stones and the cast iron pillars. Yes. The initial proposal was to uh, fell all the trees yes. and, and, and beautify the Rajpur Road. So it was because of people's pressure, because the government was scared that people would rally against this move, that they decided to keep the trees at least. So it was a kind of a compromise that we entered with the government that, uh, okay, you want to do your beautification, you, give, you want to give your money to the contractors, go ahead and do it. But not even one tree will be felt. So at least we have reached that stage and I am very hopeful that uh, we, we are going to go forward. So now when we understand that, we, we were part of that debate in the Dune School where the, uh, coincidentally this was the topic, the topic was should uh, should our histories be publicly preserved? Should, should our dark histories be publicly preserved? So now, heritage, when, when we talk about heritage, a question like that comes up. You know, how much of your, how do you eliminate what needs to be preserved? How do you decide what should be left out? What is really part of your heritage? Especially in today's socio-political environment, you know, this is quite a debate, you know, with the, the Taj Mahal not being featured in the UP government's uh, list of monuments. So where are we really in that debate, you know, and how is politics affecting heritage? Oh well, yeah, politics does affect heritage. It, uh, it kind of dictates the discourse. Uh, like for instance, if there's an orange, you don't want to call it orange safe road anymore. Or even in Dehradun, like if you have a little road, you don't want to call it a little road, you want to call it Subhash road. Uh, or it occurs in road. And, and I, I encountered this question in Rani Ket. We were at a conference and uh, with a lot of the top military officers of the country. And uh, the question we were debating was that whether Rani Khed should be declared as an eco-sensitive zone. 
when I made a presentation about the colonial bungalows in Rani Khet and uh, this uh, GOC, no less than the general officer commanding of the northern region, after my presentation said, but why should I preserve this? This reminds me of slavery. The, the colonial heritage reminds me that, in the, that we were slave for two centuries. And uh, why should we preserve all this? Uh, we should make something new. And uh, so these questions do come up. And uh, the easy answer is, and the correct answer is, that we have to live with our history. We cannot have alternate histories. We cannot say that, oh, this chapter of history I dislike because it shows me in a poor light, and therefore I will erase it from, from the textbook. You cannot do that. But I wasn't strong enough, and then someone came and made a slave out of me, and I really want to forget this. So we can't have selective memory. Uh, we have to live with our history. And uh, so when we think in terms of value, uh, the value is, uh, is not selective in terms of, oh, this was a good phase of history. Uh, so we were like, our gods were flying in airplanes, so <laughs> we could keep it uh, in, the, uh, in the history books. And this, this part of history is inconvenient, so we will forget it. You have to remember everything. And I guess we need to learn from Europe in, on this, that it's very, very important to remember the inconvenient periods. Inconvenient periods have more value attached to it. Like for instance, Germany is preserving every bit of its Nazi past. They may have, uh, you know, they may not take that much care about the other periods of their history, but the Nazi concentration camps, the Nazi storehouses, the Nazi homes, they are very, very meticulously preserved. Because uh, they have a whole commission, which is called the Commission of Memory, uh, which looks after these sites and makes sure that the new generation uh, does not repeat the same mistakes that their um, ancestors did. So, According to me, it's the inconvenient periods, uh, you know, the periods that remind us of the tragedies and the periods that remind us of the, of the things where we went weak, um, they have more heritage value than the glorious uh, past. But so each site, each object has to be uh, considered in its, uh, in its antiquity, it has to be considered in its uh, value in terms of history, and then we can decide about whether it's it's worth preserving or not. All history is worth preserving, but because we have a problem of plenty, we cannot preserve it. Uh, we need to be, you know, be a little careful, and uh, we can't leave it to the government because the government has its own interests, the governments have their own agendas. Uh, if citizens don't love their heritage, if citizens don't work towards preserving their heritage, if as parents, teachers, we don't teach our children how to respect heritage, uh, we cannot blame the government. We cannot blame the government if we uh, travel in a fancy car and we wind down the windscreens and throw the chips packet out on, on the highway. And then we end up you know, winding up the window and saying, oh, the government doesn't do anything. There's so much garbage on this heritage side. Uh, so it won't work. We have to teach to our children. We have to ourselves start respecting uh, heritage science. We have to start respecting heritage. And uh, the rest will follow. So I think the governments come and go. They are. Uh, that's why I said there were there are periods where we had great successes, and there have been periods where we had uh, lows. So the highs and lows will continue until we keep looking at the government for this. Uh, we have to take things out of our hands. But you you also said this, that there are a lot of the conservation that happened. 
because they were international organizations also committed to helping us conserve our history, our heritage. And a lot of these organizations have now disappeared from the country. Like the Ford Foundation, which is a, a, a pivotal organization in helping people who are independent. But because in India you have very limited government support, like you said. So heritage and preservation and education and research and study, all of it requires a larger infrastructure. It requires help and support. So how do you, you know, how did you traverse that challenge? And how do you propose people traverse that challenge? Again, in, in an environment where maybe there's not enough political will uh, and commitment to conserving the arts and uh, history and monuments and cultural heritage. Yeah, before we came into this talk, we were having this conversation on the table outside and someone came up to me and said that there's this monument which is very close to the Jhanda side and uh, do you know about it? And I said, and why isn't it being preserved? Why isn't it after it? And uh, so I was trying to explain that ASI, the Archaeological Survey of India, has a list of 5,000 monuments. Uh, the list hasn't, I mean they have not added one monument to the list post-independence. So, almost 70 years down the line. We still, at the time of independence, we had 5,000 protected sites. Government cannot handle more. They are still stuck up with their red forts and their Taj Mahals and their Kutub Minars and the, uh, and, and the sites which they consider very significant. And for a country of India's size and for a country of India's antiquity, uh, 5,000 sites is like just the tip of the iceberg. There are, I mean, I could, I could list out 5,000 sites in their room very easily. So, uh, so the problem is huge and we cannot even blame the government. Government has its own limitations in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of priorities. I mean, government should be spending more on health and education and stuff like that, of course they end up spending more on the military and uh, infrastructure. And infrastructure which is most of the time useless, um, like the all-weather roads uh, in, in Uttarakhand, uh, which, is, uh, which is a disaster, another disaster that we are going to experience. Uh, so, uh, the government has its own limitations, it has its own priorities and agendas. For me, traversing this challenge was, you know, it was, uh, I thought about it less in terms of money and less in terms of government support and I thought about it more in terms of people-to-people uh, -people contact and getting more people sensitized about heritage. So that's, I think that's where being there, doing that, came in. Um, only when people know about heritage, when people are thinking about it, uh, will we actually go about the work of preservation? So right now we have, uh, you know, our page has a membership of about 40,000 people, and uh, every time we announce a walk in there, we get 100, 150 odd people, uh, which makes politicians sit up and take notice. Uh, so which makes people scared that this guy can get 100 people. <laughs> To, to an office if we do something uh, something that harms the heritage. And I'll narrate a very uh, funny incident, uh, that there was this tree uh, outside Prabhat Cinema Hall. Uh, there is this people tree which was being felled uh, for road widening. That's probably the only tree that has survived on the road. And we were telling the uh, forest department, we were telling the PWD that please don't fell these old trees. And then uh, one of our members was walking down the street early in the morning um, when he noticed that there were these people felling the tree, that they were there and they had their axes and their saws and they were about to fell the tree. So uh, he called me up and he said that there is, so this tree is also going to go and it's a very old tree, can you do something to save it? I said, I've been trying and I've been failing, 
uh, to be very frank with you. Uh, no one is listening to me. They say that we have we have to widen the road, but let us try. So I called up a few people. A few people came in. We went and we told these guys to stop telling the tree for some time. And I told them that we are going to the forest department. We are going to the DFO. Let's let's reason it out with him. And we went and talked to the DFO and he said, no, there is no way you can save the tree. All the others have gone. This is right in the middle of the road. And I was trying to convince him that no, it's not in the middle of the road. It's on the edge and we can save it very easily. Uh, fortunately, one of the people in the group was a keen birder. He was a bird expert. And after a lot of heated debate, uh, this guy said, but there are so many uh, um, beaver bird nests on the tree. So he said, why didn't you tell me earlier? You should have said this earlier because now the tree comes under the Wildlife Protection Act. <laughs> and because there is a threatened species which is nesting on the tree, uh, maybe we can save the tree. So we had 50 people reasoning with him. He was, he was a little, uh, you know, he was on the back foot. Uh, but he wasn't ready to relent. And then, and we were also not ready to relent on this question. But when this point came up, uh, I think he uh, he found an escape route, and he said, "Okay, we can keep the tree now." <laughs> so, so this is what happens when people actually go and talk about these things with the government, and the government realizes that people have, uh, you know, that now they, they can rally some people around and uh, if we don't listen to them then they are going to hurt our chances in, in the future. Mm -hmm. So there is a very big challenge, there is a very big challenge of government insensitivity, there is a very big challenge of lack of money, lack of funds, um, but I guess when people come together things happen. Where is heritage in our education system? And I, I ask this also in the context of Dehradun and Mussoorie and Uttarakhand. So just in a 50 kilometer radius between Dehradun and Mussoorie you have over a thousand schools. And so on the one hand we talk about heritage and what's done for heritage and on the other hand there's a thriving education business in Uttarakhand. There is a thriving education sector in Uttarakhand. How much have they uh, or how much have these institutions really participated in passing on the idea of heritage and the idea of um, history and preservation and cultural preservation or even awareness to what we hope will be the next generation and a much more aware generation committed to, to culture. Yeah, I think heritage is on page 545 of the history textbook. Uh, so there is, yeah, it's maybe one footnote. <laughs> In, in the several chapters, I, I don't think it is anywhere. I don't think we are, uh, we can talk about heritage and we can teach heritage in, in terms of uh, textbooks and in terms of syllabi. So heritage uh, education happens on the field. It happens on the road, it happens when you are looking at the monument. And I think heritage um, education can affect uh, the other things that we are trying to teach in a, in a great way, like for instance citizenship and civics that we are trying to teach, or history. <laughs> if, if we teach education in the right manner, it will, it will impact uh, the other subjects greatly. But the sad part is like, I always tell principals, I always tell heads of schools, and, and when we talk about schools in Dehradun and Masuri, these schools are the schools which, uh, which bring out products which we will find in leadership roles uh, a few years from now. In, uh, in the Rajiv Nadi cabinet, there were uh, at least eight or ten doscos, and we could count them. So, if the country's cabinet has 10 students from the dual school, you can imagine how much clout they have. But the tragedy of these boarding schools is that kids spend their formative years in these schools 
this, they live 10 years, 12 years in, in a boarding, but they don't get to know Dehradun beyond the McDonald's and the President and the Madhuban and the Pizza Hut. So that's their weekend outing, that's where they go and then they get back inside the school. So how do you sensitize these students about heritage and, and bring in heritage education? Um, again, it's, it's a huge challenge. We are trying to do things in our own small ways. Like for instance, we are trying to uh, educate the teachers first. Very, very important and very challenging. Much more challenging than teaching the students is uh, you know, sensitizing the teachers about heritage. Because they've studied history in a particular way, they've studied geography in a uh, structured way, and they, they are not prepared to change the way they uh, transmit to the students. So, uh, we are involving students, we are involving teachers uh, in several ways, but, uh, but uh, I would hope that heritage becomes, uh, you know, if, if there are teachers here, if there are uh, school heads sitting in this audience, I would, uh, I would really invite them to uh, get in touch with us. We could come to the schools, we could uh, sensitize students about heritage um, through workshops. And, uh, and there's so many different ways in which it can be done, but unfortunately it is is not finding the right audience. We still have a huge challenge in entering <coughs> schools because the schools tend to think that they already have overcrowded programs and uh, uh, they probably don't need to do much in, in terms of educating young people about heritage. But it is essential. It's, it's very important. I wish, you know, uh, there would be more leaders like Rajiv Gandhi, who, who were sensitized about Eratul's uh, heritage. I was in class 12 when he became the Prime Minister. And uh, we had a nature club in our school. And uh, I think there are seven or eight schools in those times that had nature clubs. So uh, he came to, for the good school uh, centenary celebrations. And it was decided that all the nature clubs would come together and give him a representation about the limestone <coughs> quarries in Missouri. Um, so the nature club representatives went after him and gave him a petition. We were really scared. And he asked some of the nature school heads that let's take a helicopter ride and look, let's look at the quarries. So he was sensitive enough to do that. And all these kids, they were flying around Missouri uh, with him. On the, on the helicopter, looking at the limestone quarries. Some of the limestone quarries had been painted green by the quarry owners. You know, they, they just put a coat of green, uh, green paint on the... Uh, but he went back, uh, the Eco Task Force was formed, uh, the quarries stopped working, and, and I think that was a major, major success story for the so these things are possible. These things have happened in our country. And uh, there is a possibility of much more. So it's all, not all bad. It's all, not all, uh, you know, tragic. <laughs> there is hope. Yes, there is. There's plenty of hope. A story or a, a tree, a bird, a memory. The first one that really felt or that really made established your connection with where you are today, with your love for heritage, with your work in heritage. The very first that you remember. Okay, the very first. <laughs> the very first from uh, music because uh, my, uh, as I said earlier, my um, work in heritage started with music and dance and um, it was uh, I think it was in the, the 80s early 80s uh, that Pandit Kumar Gandharu came to Dehradun and I was this standard public school guy 
who would listen to hard metal and rock and and uh, there was no uh, individual in, a, in my friend circle who, who would uh, who would ever even talk about classical music. So my parents liked to hear classical music. My family liked puzzles. And even when I mentioned puzzles in conversations with friends, they would say, oh, you shut up this sissy talk. Don't, don't, don't talk about all these things. Huh? Yeah, you're not cool enough. And um, then Pandit Kumar Gandharva came. And, um, because I was given some responsibilities of organizing the concert. So I said, all right, now let me, uh, let me arrange the chairs and let me arrange the mics. But I, I did not expect anything to happen in the concert because I thought I would do the arrangements and move out. But I sat through the concert. And once the concert was over, I realized that for the next three years I was maybe walking two inches above the ground. Um, there was something that had happened to me. So he had touched a chord and I was transformed. And I realized that it was not sissy anymore to talk about classical music. <laughs> that this is what I loved, this is what I liked, and this is what was much uh, uh, I mean, it had much more depth than the kind of music I had heard until then. And uh, uh, that's when I decided to start working. So I think that was the first, uh, that was the first transformational experience, if you want to call it. Uh, that really gave me the confidence that whatever traditions we have within our country must be understood before we can start understanding metal or rock or whatever, let's, let's understand our own traditions and, and then think about what's happening elsewhere. And uh, my last question to you is, your favorite chapter in being there to that and why? Is yet to come. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Yet, uh, see, be there, do that has been a revelation. It has been a revelation in the sense that uh, I never expected so many people to uh, to become a part of be there, do that. Um, I thought we would do some, we would try something, and we would uh, make a lot of effort for two, three years, and then it would, you know, it would be like a project. You start a project, and the project ends. Uh, but this project seems to uh, be growing all the time and uh, so today we have at least four towns in Dehradun that want to start heritage box. We've just gone to Almora and set up a heritage box program in Almora. Next fortnight is Nenital. So Almora district administration calls us to do it. Uh, Nenital it's the hotel association which calls us. Now I've been trying to enter the hotel association in Dehradun for years and years and they don't seem to be interested in heritage walks. But Nenital Hotel Association seems to be very interested in heritage walks. So it's, it's the sheer diversity of groups that are trying to get involved. See, heritage walk is not, uh, you know, I don't love this program because we are doing it. Uh, the program intrinsically empowers community. It's not about government, it's not about uh, tourism as we understand it. So normally when we think in terms of tourism, we think about it in terms of a group coming in from America or a group coming in from Europe, bringing their dollars and euros, uh, splurging it around. But Heritage Box is about community. You uh, the community organizes the work, they decide on a starting point, they tell people about their heritage. So when a community leader is talking about heritage, he or she is also very involved in honoring and respecting that heritage. The people, the local people who turn up for the work, they are also getting sensitized about it. And you don't generate any waste, you don't do any like you 
when you walk in, uh, when you drive a car on Rajpur Road, people go honking all the time. So this is a group which does not generate any carbon footprint. So uh, somewhere it's the tourism department, somewhere it's the um, you know the community, somewhere it's the hotel association, and, and I think that's the significant aspect of what we are doing that um, people are realizing the value of walking as as also a part of viable tourism. Huh? All along we have thought about tourism in terms of infrastructure. And I keep telling government officials, I keep telling people that a visitor who comes to Uttarakhand is not interested in your infrastructure. As it is, you don't have any infrastructure. <laughs> so, and and if, if you start thinking of competing with places like Singapore and Hong Kong, it's never going to happen. You can, I mean, whatever you do, you cannot create that kind of infrastructure. So if someone comes in from Germany or Singapore or England, he's not interested in the infrastructure. He's interested in the communities, how they live. He's interested in the traditional homes. He's interested in your local cuisine. And when you think in terms of tourism, you think in terms of all weather. You fell all the trees on the highway, you have a four-lane highway. Now who's interested in a road? They are not going to lick your roads. They are, they are coming here to look at your trees. So, uh, there is this huge gap between uh, what the visitor wants and what the officials think is tourism. And I think we, they are doing that, we are able to give an authentic experience of the community to, to the people who join the box. So we, we talk about local food, we talk about how a wooden house is built, we talk about uh, living in that house, we talk about history. So that's a long answer. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, but that's the, uh, I think that chapter is still being written and uh, uh, 2018 is going to be a very significant year for us because the target is to spread out to all 13 districts. Of and uh, maybe in a year's time we'll meet again and talk about this. No, I wish all of us good luck on that because I think it's a joint mission. It's not you're not alone in this mission. I think the audience here speaks for it. You know the fact that that this has been uh, a success, and when, and it's not a personal success. It's a success for the community. It's a success for humanity. It's a success for culture, art, and heritage. So. I really, I really want to say that uh, I am so proud of your courage <laughs> to, to do something that takes a lot more than courage. You know? I, I can imagine... It takes foolishness. <laughs> <laughs> and I must tell you that there are quite a few foolish people <laughs> sitting in this crowd who are... <laughs> Part of the gang, so to say. <laughs> so I, I said that that was my last question. I'm really tempted to ask, you know, that one moment where you felt that you're probably doing something really foolish, and another moment that she told you that no, I'm so happy I'm doing this. Two two different stories. So one that really killed your model, and one that said you're in the right place doing the right thing. Well, I, I guess I was fortunate that. Those moments were many more. Um, I, I can't remember any moment of despair. I can't remember any moment when I said, oh my god, uh, what am I doing? I shouldn't be doing this. I don't think that moment has come as yet. <laughs> it might come. <laughs> yeah, and I hope it never comes. Uh, so there's never been this moment of disillusionment. But uh, yes, we've had uh, many successes. And I, I can't even claim that we, uh, you know, we succeeded all the time. We have failed miserably several times. But even then, I came back with this uh, conviction that we tried our best. We, under the circumstances, this is what we could do. And if it did not work, so be it. Let's move on to the next thing. Uh, 
successes uh, in terms of you know feeling good about it, I think it happens every Sunday. <laughs> every Sunday we try something new, we try something even more stupid, and uh, and I don't sleep this Saturday night, and I keep thinking about uh, no one is going to turn up this Sunday morning, no one is going to come, and I keep telling my team members, Sargam and others, that this one is going to be a washout, and then you see. <laughs> hundred people there and then I realized that no probably we are doing something right we are learning the right way and and we can take this forward so uh, yeah I think uh, you should come this Sunday and see <laughs> I'm pitching <laughs> I'll try and do that I'll try and bring a few people also with me to do that um, since we're in Uttarakhand, and uh, since a lot of your work has been on heritage in Uttarakhand, I want to ask you, is there a favorite spot, like a favorite historic or a monumental or just a, a spot out of memory, a heritage spot that you, you would like in Teratum and outside of Teratum? As, as a parent, I'm not allowed to be choosy. Um, all sites are important for me. But yeah, there's this one spot that I really love uh, in Uttarakhand, uh, which is uh, a place called Cranks Ridge in Almora. Um, so, uh, Cranks Ridge is also known as Kasar Devi. It's a little temple in Almora. Uh, but, uh, so when, when I went up to the spot, I went in to see the temple, and I thought it was just a little temple. Uh, but then I realized that this was the place where the hippie movement was born. This was the place where uh, people like Cat Stevens, Alan, Stim Alan Ginsberg, and uh, you know the Beatles, and everyone had come, and and no one knew about it. So we started picking up more information, and uh, and we came up with this book <coughs> Timothy Leary. So Timothy Leary was a professor at Harvard. He was, of course. Most of the time he was he was a professor of metaphysics, and most of the time he was high on drugs. Uh, but uh, he came and lived in in Kasar Devi, and uh, so so Kasar Devi has this unique blend of Buddhism and um, and local culture and the hippie movement, which came together at, at this place and, and gave it the name Thanks Ridge, you know, Madman's Ridge. And it's a green. <laughs> Thank you, Lokesh. Thank you. This has been very enriching and also very personal, which was the, the intention of knowing the person behind the movement. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but Lokesh uh, was listed by Kandanas Travers, one of the 50 people you must know in the Himalayas. And, <laughs> not for your work, a lot of these stories would have been missing from the whole landscape, you know. So thank you for keeping it alive. I would now like to open the floor for questions. So please have your hands up and some people bring a microphone to you. There are a lot of, lot of hands up there already. Can we start from the back? Because we usually tend to start from the front. <laughs> question, it take a long time to uh, answer, but uh, see, it's a, it's a cosmology, because you are from the region, uh, you would know that uh, people have complete faith in Mahasu, and uh, if you compare it with Dehradun, and if you compare it with Uttarakhand, um, it's 
So a lot of time when I give my presentations in academic seminars, I am I am asked this question: that is it, it is is it just a question of faith? Is it just a question of uh, belief? Or is it is there something which is really happening? So for us, when I go there as an outsider, when, when someone goes there to do research or to to see the things, and we have uh, been educated in a particular way. Uh, so we are skeptical, we rationalize everything, but it's very important to look at science in the same way, the way we look at these traditions. Um, it's, it's important to look at science also, uh, like for instance, if, uh, if someone turns 40 years old and they go to a doctor for an executive health check, so they go to a doctor for an executive health check, the doctor takes one drop of your blood, puts it in a slide, puts it under the microscope and says that you have diabetes, today you are off sugar from today onwards, you have to take this pill every, uh, every day for the rest of your life. So what do you do? You give away your decision making, you give, your, give away the agency as we call it in anthropology. You give away your agency to the microscope. Whatever the microscope says, you believe it without questioning because you think it's science. It, the microscope is also made of glass and steel and metal and, uh, and even the doctor gives his agency to the microscope. Because the microscope says that you have diabetes, you accept I mean, 10 minutes ago you were well and now you accept that you are sick. Uh, even a patient when he says, oh, I am perfectly fine, nothing is wrong with me, I just walked in for a health check, regular health check. And I don't feel sick, but the microscope says that you are sick. So you start believing. <laughs> now in Uttarakhand, uh, there is one mental health hospital, which, which is which just has a building, it has no doctors, mind you. There are two psychiatrists in there. No other district in Uttarakhand has any psychiatrist. Our communities still are mentally quite healthy without the psychiatrists, without the science. <laughs> so where is this mental health coming from? <laughs> I hope there are no psychiatrists in the audience. <laughs> um, but, so, our communities, they have this, you know, uh, inherent capacity to heal um, themselves mentally because of their belief in these Devi Devtas, because of their belief in these possession rituals. Uh, so, if, if this system works for us, great. You know, we don't need to import another system and start uh, behaving according to that system and start accepting their principles and ideas. So it's a question of belief, it's a question of faith. If you think the Devta is really speaking through the Mari uh, and it helps you, you, you are welcome to continue with the belief. Okay, thank you. Hello sir, uh, actually I would like to ask you a question. Sir, uh, most of the villagers, most of the people since the last two decades are migrating from the villages to the cities. From the villages of uh, Garhwal and Kumau and Uttarkashi. So sir, how is this uh, high level rate of migration affecting the world of divine powers, the local deities that uh, reign over this mountainous area? So, Okay. So, uh, yes, migration is impacting our society a great deal. Uh, migration, it, it's very tough to uh, bring a complete end to migration. Uh, politicians have tried, NGOs have tried, it hasn't worked. So people are migrating and I'm not too scared of the migration. I, I mean, as a heritage person, it is not uh, something that I would subscribe to. It would be great if the communities lived where they have lived for centuries. 
But then our social structure is such that migration is going to happen. So there have been phases of migration. Like earlier there was the money order economy. So the money order economy was also a form of migration. You had all the young men going into the military post-independence. They were sending remittances. They weren't rich enough that the whole family could migrate. So they used to send a money order to the village. Now because we have a state, we have more incomes uh, and, and the youth, especially the young men, they are not just dependent on the military for their incomes. The women are also educated. The women also have the benefit of education. So now uh, the woman is educated and, uh, and men and women can migrate together. So, so this is a social phenomenon which needs to be uh, studied very carefully. But yes, of course, uh, we are all turning modern. We are all turning, uh, you know, the new uh, education that we are getting in schools is making us believe that this is superstition, this is blind faith, uh, this is black magic. And, and therefore, uh, we don't, uh, I mean, the coming generations may not subscribe to these beliefs uh, and, and uh, which would be really tragic, which would be really tragic because, uh, but as of now, I don't see a threat to the Devi Devka system. Um, but yes, the, the, there are things which are happening in our society, like for instance, uh, roles were assigned. In, in a Devta procession, the roles were assigned very clearly that uh, the dhol will be played by the Das community. Now all the Das communities uh, who are the scheduled castes are getting reservations. So they get the reservations and because the high castes don't pay them well enough, the dholi job is not very respectable. So in the coming years you will not find people who can play the dhol. So if you can't play the dhol, you can't move the dhol. It is, it is uh, ritual, right? uh, the person who plays the dhol, even though he is from the low caste, he has to chant the mantras, only then the devta will rise. So, if you don't have the dhol players, the devtas will not rise, they will not travel. If they can't travel, the entire system will disappear. The entire belief system will disappear, then we will need more psychiatrists. <laughs> So then the so-called scientists will jump into the... Yeah, yeah maybe. So, uh, talking about the Devi Devtas only, uh, you are saying you know, that if people do not pay the door, as in the caste doesn't pay the door, uh, the entire system will get abolished. So, isn't this serving a heritage like this? Doesn't this uh, really encourage the caste system as well? Something which we do not want to preserve, as you we were talking about earlier. Yeah, there, there are several contradictions within the whole uh, within the whole idea. Uh, it's uh, I think it has uh, less to do with uh, you know caste inequalities, but it has more to do with uh, with skills and and the economic return for what you are doing. So the practices that you are uh, doing, the responsibilities that are given to you, uh, your judgments are not ready to pay you. They are not ready to compensate. And uh, so the idea is to make the dholi profession respectable. You know, you can also do away with caste by making the drum player feel respectable about his job. That's one way of approaching. Problem. The other way of approaching the problem is to say that oh this is uh, this tradition it perpetuates the caste system so do away with it you know so uh, there are two ways of uh, looking at the caste if we start looking at the drumming tradition like for instance there are so many inter colleges in Uttarakhand I keep telling uh, you know the education department and others that. Uh, you are teaching classical music in, in your inter colleges, degree colleges. There is a B Muse course, there is an N Muse course. Why can't you have one 
Dholi teaching the Dhol. There is so much oral literature behind it, there is so much technicality behind it, you could easily have a bachelor's course in Dhol playing. Uh, and so this Dholi who is a scheduled caste person who is not treated respectively in the village will now become a professor. But at least he will have the incentive to preserve his British. So, I mean, we can throw the baby out with the bathwater. He can say that, okay, get rid of traditions because they perpetuate the caste system. The other way of doing it is making it respectable. Make it get more returns economically, make it more respectable too. But a system like this will promote the caste society to play the drums, right? It will not, I mean, uh, why can't any other society play the drums? It doesn't yeah. have to be like, how we learn the violin or the tabla, but it does not have to be like, you know, we are from a particular caste only, then we can play the tabla, or mm -hmm. from a particular caste only, then we can play the violin. It does not have to be, you know, uh, preserving the caste mm -hmm. system in general. I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. When, when a person is teaching, uh, you know, drumming, at the moment, the drum players, they come from the caste community. But when you start giving it respect, then, then any, any, any person is free to come and learn. I would love to go and learn uh, to play the tone and I've learned it you know, during the course of my uh, research as well. So, I'm, I'm, I would never say that restrict it to one community. What I am trying to say is only that preserve the tradition. Don't let the tradition die just because you want to end the caste system or something which is, you know, which is exploitative of people. So, we can be uh, very choosy in this. So we can have the dholis uh, who are presently from the caste community teach it to the Rajputs, teach it to the families, teach it to everyone who wants to learn. Look at it as music, don't look at it as, a, a, you know, a ritual practice. Uh, Lokesh, uh, thank you. It's a wonderful evening. Uh, we have learned a lot. Something uh, that I have learned. Hello, hello, hello. One thing that I have learned from what you have said. One thing that I have learned from what you have said is that government is no friend of language. Even though some individuals can live it. And you mentioned two names, Indira Gandhi and Rajiv Gandhi. To my mind, uh, the contribution that the first Prime Minister made was in the form of the wonderful books that he wrote on history. Yes. We learned such a lot about our own heritage from the book that he wrote. Now, those who have not read this book are so much of poor from it. Because there's so much to learn about our heritage from that great book. Having said this, uh, my, my feeling is that individuals do make a difference to the monolith that these slovenly governments generally are. And as you mentioned, these two prime ministers did make a difference. Do you see any hope in the current dispensation or do you see any bright spot coming up for the future who can take us away from those thoughts of... Even that is, that is also heritage, those stories about God flying in chariots. That might also be heritage, that is heritage. But then, uh, a more scientific look at heritage, a more scientific look at history and all. Do you have any hope for people who are directly in charge or are likely to be calling shots? Yeah, I guess the hope is within all of us. It's, it's, uh, if we are more sensitized and if we are more aware, uh, Government will change. Today also, you know, government as a monolith may not be very sensitive towards heritage, but there are individuals within government who are very sensitized and uh, and who are willing to help to help the cause. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Nehru and you mentioned his contribution in writing the history books. I started my work on John Sarvabar, I realized that the first Chief Minister of Himachal, uh, Vyas Parmar, was himself an anthropologist. And the first ever uh, thesis, doctoral thesis, 
on John Sar was written by him. And, and very interestingly, he had documented all these rituals and practices in his time. And, and Himachal was lucky that, that probably for the first 10-12 years, they had an anthropologist as a chief minister. So, um, so yeah, is there an idea? Is there? <laughs> I, I thought I thought you would catch the subtle hint. <laughs> but um, so there are individuals. There are individuals who have made an immense uh, contribution, and um, I, I guess we have to. There is a lot of hope because uh, <coughs> the only uh, you know. Uh, Little thing that I see with the, with the services, with the IAS and the IPS, the people who control a lot of the government machinery, is that uh, today almost 80% of the civil servants come from the applied sciences. They come from IITs, they come from IIMs, they have either studied management or they have studied physics or chemistry or astrophysics or something. Um, and Earlier, the, the services came from the humanities. You know, the subjects were the, the arts. And, and that, I think, is an anomaly that we need to correct. We need to have a balance uh, there. Because uh, most of our bureaucrats today, uh, they don't have a grounding in, in the arts. They're completely blind. I mean, even the ASI Act, they are not aware of. They have not read the ASI Act. So, uh, uh, then I think we need to correct things, but there are a lot of young people who are uh, very interested in, in societies, who are going in-depth in, in learning about these societies, and, and I think there is, uh, we will see a positive change. There is a lot of hope uh, for the future. <coughs> Uh, my question uh, to you today was, uh, as an anthropologist, uh, there, in heritage when we talk about it, there is a old spoken heritage, there is a tangible heritage and both do come under the same thing called heritage. So how do you as an anthropologist or any anthropologist world over make this differentiation between where the myth stops? and the actual heritage begins, which needs to be preserved. Some myths, today that is exactly the onset of what we are seeing today is, actual heritage is being distorted or being ignored, and, why, uh, and whereas the myths are being propagated as a proper history and heritage. So, there is a social aspect to it, which comes with the politics and so many other things. But where, as an anthropologist, do you have any guidelines where you think that this comes under a proper heritage worth saving? And does everything has a social beneficial aspect to it? Well, uh, anthropology has no clear uh, guideline uh, on how to separate myth from history. Uh, myths are significant. Myths are very, very important. But myths have to be seen in their context. The myth has to be seen in terms of the period in which it was uh, created and, and the purpose that it serves. And unless you have two or three sources that give the material proof, you cannot treat it as history. So that kind of you know broad uh, demarcation is there, but there is no thin line, and, and people are always crossing these lines either way. How many people remember Uday Shankar's academy, dance academy which was set up there because I mean they didn't have a building, you know, they all used to work in open air. So. <laughs> Uday Shankar dance academy is now, uh, it's, uh, so Uday Shankar came to Almora and uh, he set up his uh, dance academy. Uh, and it's very remarkable that so many great people followed him to Almora. Like for instance, uh, Gurudar was one of the members in his dance troupe. 
He was loving to dance. Zora Segal was a dance teacher with the group. Pandit Ravi Shankar was the music director. Huh? And uh, Segal and uh, so so many names who have become greats in in the world of arts were part of the academy. They were they were idolizing or they were part of the dance troupe. And uh, so both the Shankars, Uday Shankar and Pandit Ravi Shankar, they got married in Almora. So that was another, uh, you know, uh, very, very significant event which happened in Almora. But unfortunately, the academy was not in existence. And then the government decided to set up the academy 10 years ago, I think, 10 years ago. Uh, about 10 years ago, it was inaugurated by none other than the President of India, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam. But the locks haven't been opened since. Yeah. <laughs> so the academy hasn't started functioning. Uh, so people do remember and, and they get very angry when you mention the <coughs> Uday Shankar Dance Academy. <coughs> A blessed to attend this session and it's good to see you as well. So I hope like most of the audiences from the Dehradun or the Uttarakhand only and uh, whenever we are introducing ourselves like we are from Dehradun. So people project Dehradun environment and the a good building environment. But from inner side we always know like the environment is not going on the right track because in summer we, are, we can feel the temperature of 45 degree and 50 degree even. So like I was in Europe of like for more time for the number of years and I used to represent myself I'm from Dehradun and I was glad to see German and European are able to recognize the Dehradun but now when I live here I feel like temperature is going really high and I just want to know you are directly in the conversation with the government so uh, is that the government is doing any kind of an initiation for the in the terms of the environment as well? See, uh, thank you for this question uh, as I said earlier the government has its own agenda, it has its own priorities. Uh, if you have lived in Europe, so you would notice that uh, in the European cities, I have traveled across Europe and I have actually uh, observed uh, people in, in Europe. Like for instance, I live in a city called Heidelberg, which is by the Neckar River. And uh, you, you can please sit down. So, uh, the Neckar is uh, probably the cleanest rivers I have seen anywhere. And it runs, it carries so many ships every day. Of course, people are not allowed to bathe in the river. Uh, there is a little section where dogs can jump into the river, but only a little section. And uh, the river is pristine. It's, it passes through so many cities, so many big cities. And, and still the river is kept pristine. And I was very... Uh, you know, curious to see how this is happening. So, one evening there was this big party by the river, which is called the prom. So, all these young people who graduate from school, uh, they are given one night's freedom to do whatever they want. They all gather at the riverside and they have a huge party. So, there was this huge party and there were thousands and thousands of young people drinking. They were drinking all the time. In Germans, they are drinking most of the time in, in Germany. So they were drinking all night and they were having a party. And the next morning there was, you know, trash everywhere. And then within five minutes, I saw the, this huge group of about 50 grandmothers. Uh, they got the trash picked up and they clicked all the pictures of the trash. They stood there in the sun the whole day. They, they set up an exhibition. <laughs> and anyone who was passing by, they were telling uh, people that uh, this is what our young people are doing. This is what they should not be doing. Um, and this is not the way we, we have to keep our city. So it was citizens. You know, there was no government involvement there. It was the citizens who were creating the trash. Unfortunately, in India, what we have done is that uh, we have said that I can create the trash. I can eat my chips and throw the packet right there. Uh, someone from the, from another caste will come and clean it up. Some other group will come and uh, clean up my mess. It won't work that way. Every individual is responsible for 
the environment. Uh, you know, the way we spoil the environment, we have to be uh, we have we have to be individually responsible to clean it up or to keep it pristine or to keep it fresh. So let's stop looking at government. Uh, let's go people to people. Let's go to one person at a time. Talk to people as a lot of people in this room are doing. Vidhima is doing. Soumya is there. Uh, then they are making great efforts in going one to one and telling people that this is how you can manage your own trash. You don't need, uh, you know, sarkari uh, vehicles. You don't need nagar nigam sweepers sweeping the roads in the night. Every citizen should should feel responsible. So government is doing what it has to do, and government is spreading itself too thin in different things. They don't have the means. We have just so many people in here. But every citizen, if they become responsible for their own environment, I think things will change. Things will become much better. Should I use this? Is it working? Yes. Actually, there are two things I wanted to speak about. One is, of course, related to an earlier question about the young generation moving away from these hills and uh, they are in some way getting a little bit disconnected with the traditions that are the age old traditions and I could make this out I was doing a story on the Diwali which is uh, celebrated one month late in that area and I talked to a few people and I came to know that the youngsters you know because they are working outside they are not able to get leave during you know the months because the Diwali they get the leave during the normal Diwali so they are not able to attend most of them are not able to get back to their homes so the things are changing in that sense so what I feel is that this may happen more and more in uh, context of various traditions and uh, I think there should be definitely some way of you know preserving uh, these traditions uh, through I mean something uh, at the school stage definitely something should be there you know at least in the schools of Uttarakhand uh, there should be some chapters or some kind of you know fixed workshops or anything where the students can grow up you know learning about these and uh, uh, since you know uh, the schools in Dehradun and Masuri some of them are so old that they are themselves heritage campuses so they should at least know about the heritage of their own buildings. The students, I think some of them do not even know that. You know, like schools like Colonel Brown and RIMC and Dune School and Wellam and Weinberg and Woodstock. They are, you know, some of them are more than 150 years old. The Okra and so I do not even, I do not think that they are even aware of the place they are living in and studying. So something. Uh, you know, an initiative uh, has to be made. I feel that they should know something about the traditions of the hills, the heritage sites, the heritage buildings. So uh, I feel that would really work well. So, what do you think, Lokesh? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's wonderful. It should happen. Uh, so schools can start with their own campuses then they can move out to the city. But I'll narrate one or two anecdotes and uh, so and, and give you a you know overview of the actual scenario. Uh, like when we used to work for Spikmai KA, we used to think that uh, that we have to enter the school and talk to the kids about classical music. And we need to enter the school and we need to talk to the, uh, we need to sensitize young people about the traditions of India. And you know, I worked for Spick McKay for close to a decade and I realized that the worst enemy of uh, Spick McKay in all the schools were the music teachers. <laughs> so, you know, the moment you went to the music teachers, they would feel threatened that someone is trying to enter my field and, and, and maybe they will undermine my position. So, we, we always made it a point. Later on, we understood this. And we, and we made it a point that if classical music, ke bare mein bachche ko batana hai, to, oh, talk to the English teacher, talk to the science teacher, talk to the maths teacher, never talk to the music teacher. <laughs> because they did not never allow you to enter. And then there is this, you know, uh, another incident. 
आपको नहीं लगता है इट्स ग्रेट टू सी यू बट या माई दैट्स माई माई पर्सनल एक्सपीरियंस वी वी बी ट्राइंग टू एंटर अ लॉर्ड स्कूल फ्रॉम द हेरिटेज पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू एंड सो वी experience schools like we do a program which is called adopt a monument program we ask schools to adopt uh, one monument and uh, and what we have tried maybe once a year the school students can go there we tell them about the history we tell them about the heritage and uh, and we ask them to clean up the monument so uh, we go up to the school and we ask the principal that we want to do this and the principal agrees they like the idea very much but when it comes to the implementation stage on a school journals cover <laughs> so the monument has to be in the background and it has to be you know look like a monument it has to be photogenic <laughs> it has to uh, create good copy uh, sensitizing young people uh, about heritage uh, asking them to uh, draw the monument asking them to document the uh, monument we just done uh, a big program the the schools of uh, of dehradun you will be surprised to know that there are about um, four architecture schools in dehradun there are about 54 universities in this town uh, i was also shocked that there are 54 universities Um, like there are these big DITs and uh, IMSs and others, but there are also these small universities all over the place. So there are some districts as 54. Imagine if we can tap all the youth in these universities, uh, what a difference we can make uh, to the city. Uh, so we are working with architecture uh, schools, and we did a wall painting directory of Uttarakhand. so we prepared a directory of wall paintings all these architecture students they were trained to document wall paintings to take measurements to make layouts to take photographs the right way uh, so we are trying to do these things in our own small way because with whatever means we have but yeah, it's a huge task and uh, we we must all get together to do it Uh, should I or yeah. Vinayak asked this question? Okay. Vinayak is not allowed to ask. <laughs> so, um, uh, hi. Um, I really wanted to ask this question in this form. Okay. Um, and I face this problem all the time. Like um, when we highlight places like the Crans Ridge, okay, or uh, these little nooks and corners that remain, okay, from this onslaught of tourism and development in Uttarakhand. Unplanned tourism and development in Uttarakhand. Uh, isn't there that that at the back of your mind? Next time I come back, there will be this glass-faced, um, six-story resort coming up here, and you know the whole village taken over by land mafia, everything getting converted. <coughs> um, I mean, how do we address that? We have the same problem when we talk about nature here in Uttarakhand. Yeah, this question is very valid. Uh, when we started the heritage walks, after about a month or so, to my horror, I realized that a lot of the builders were also part of the walks. They were coming with us, and they were probably trying to identify nice sites to develop. So, uh, so it was quite shocking for all of us. And then we thought, how should we sideline these people? How should we tell these people that they should not come to our walks? but it works both ways it's a double edged sword if if you don't sensitize citizens about heritage uh these if the sites are beautiful they will eventually be taken over by tourists who will throw their trash there 
Like when I talk to the elderly citizens of Dehradun, a lot of the elderly citizens say, हाँ सेस्ट धारा तो है हम तीस साल से गए नहीं वहाँ इतना गंदगी है रॉबर्स के कौन जाएगा वहाँ तो शराब की बोतलें होती हैं हाँ सो वी केव अप रॉबर्स के वी केव अप सेस्ट धारा वी अलाउड दिस साइट्स टू बिकम ट्रैश्ड एंड वी थॉट ओके आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू सेस्ट धारा नाउ बिकॉज़ इट्स डर्टी लेट मी गो टू शिकार फॉल so that that is what happens when citizens don't take control of their own sites. So if hundred citizens go, and out of those ten may be tourists, but ninety will be concerned citizens, and and they will realize that the place is it's really gone down the drain, and um, that that is the reason why we do the uh, garbage walk with you. So Somya who asked the question. Uh, leads our garbage walk and, and we really talk about garbage. We show people garbage. That this is what we are doing and this garbage could have been managed the right way. So, um, uh, we have to get the right kind of people to these places. Uh, that's my idea because if, if we just abandon them, if we stop taking people to these places, um, anyways they are going to go away. Like, uh, like we have seen with Sesta, it's, it's a very, very uh, glaring example of, uh, there's so many people sitting here, I can take a poll, uh, if you leave the heritage walk apart, how many people have gone to Sesta in the last 10 years? Just a few youngsters at the back. And an old man. Due to Dehradun's Yeah. So, but if everyone in Dehradun went up to Sesdara and said, that well, this, is, this is so dirty, why can't we do something about it? I, I think it would change. Uh, being an engineer, I have to say this to defend my profession. That don't you think, I like all this very much. But don't you think heritage and development should go hand in hand? Not, uh, they, they should not be contrary to each other. And uh, that would not be good for India either. Definitely. I mean, I, I would never uh, oppose the development. But this development has to be sensitive. Even when we talk about conservation, even when we talk about restoring buildings and sites, uh, science enters in a very big way. And without science, we cannot, uh, we cannot do a good job of conservation. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you have seen it in Europe. I have to that things can go hand in hand. Yeah, they are definitely. They are very conscious about the heritage, but that doesn't mean they are not developing. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So we we can have things uh, going together. So last two questions. Um, I think the other point. Yeah. Just, just let me add one thing. I do agree with Lokesh that the development should not be corruption. It should be development. It should be development. <laughs> Can I add, add something to I mean, uh, a question raised earlier uh, about heritage or nature being included in school curricula? I always uh, am afraid that it will become again a part of road learning and uh, very afraid that it will become you know typical education. Why can't it be discovery? Uh, how do we modulate discovery into school curricula? We can discover heritage or nature wherever we are, in any building, in any place where we live. And that's why I said you have to do it in the field. You can't do it in the classroom. Uh, and schools are scared of sending children out, I don't know why, into the field. So, yes, but we need to sit down and uh, find a way out. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Sir, I'm sure. Sir, in the context of migration only, I want to ask one question. Sir, like Ashok said, uh, sir, during this year only, in 2017, uh, during the time of state elections, both the rival parties, BJP, as well as the Indian National Congress, as well as the Uttarakhand Kranti, they've mentioned in their manifestos that they will be doing a reverse migration. 
see reverse migration something like that a person who have migrated from body wall, a backward area of body wall, or TV or chamonia etc he have migrated from that particular area to Dehradun in search of occupation or various other comforts so sir uh, keeping the political aspects or keeping the political aspect beside I want to, I just want to ask one question is this reverse migration possible? Very difficult question. See, every family has their own reasons for migration. It's not a, it's not a, you know, blanket phenomenon. कि ऐसा हो रहा है. एक reason तो मुझे दिखता है कि economic reasons हैं. और social reason ये है that the whole family is now in a position to migrate en masse. In earlier times, they were not in a position to migrate like that. So only the men migrated when we had the money ordering order. So, political parties can claim what they claim. I don't think all migration is bad. Some, every family has their own reasons why they are migrating. People just generalize. They say that education is not, medical facilities are not, so migration is not. This may be a general reason. That there may be some truth in it. But then every family has their own story to tell. That we came from the village to the city because of these reasons. Now, unless our development patterns change, unless the manner in which we look at development changes, uh, this is not going to stop. No party has the power to stop people. Unless they can offer economic uh, opportunities within the village. So, in our own small way, we are trying to do that. We are trying to. Uh, Tell people in the cities, now we have a social media presence. What we did with some communities was that we told them uh, that we will come and work with you for a maybe three year period, four year period. Uh, we will bring in the tourists. Uh, so I, I can't work with villages which have already been abandoned, but I could try working with villages where still some families live. So I went to a village called Bhangeli in Uttar Kashi, which is off the main highway. It's not connected to the highway. You have to trek three kilometers to reach up to Bhangeli village. It's a beautiful village with wooden homes. A lot of the old architecture still survives. So we went up to these people. We said, we will bring in the tourists for the next four or five years. Are you willing to work with us? Now, we in the government, the tourism department has developed a homestay policy. The homestay policy says that the government's homestay policy is that we give you a loan. You have a house, we give you a loan. You make a house with your house, make a camera, make a toilet. You should be a double bed. You should be a toilet western. You should be a time. There are these terms and conditions which are mentioned. Now, which family in the village can maintain that kind of room because tourism is seasonal you know for six months in a year the tourist will not be there so your entire policy is flawed what we told the villagers was that we are willing to work with you but you will not build a toilet if the visitor comes to you you will say that's how we do it you should also try it out uh, that you will, you, we will not serve you Maggi. We will only serve the food that we eat. And believe me, there are so many people in the cities who are willing to buy that. They are willing to spend money on that kind of food. That where they, they are asked to step out of their comfort zone and experience something which they never experienced before. So, we are working with these. Uh, we are working on four projects. Uh, Devalsari is one, Bhangeli is another, the two more, and there is mixed success. But in Bhangeli village, I found, found 25 young people who were young men. Hmm? The women, of course, they keep working the whole day, um, but we still say that they are unemployed. They work, they work day and night. But these men, they were just sitting at home, doing nothing. Uh, the waiting for something to happen or waiting to get a job in Dehradun or Uttarkashi or wherever. 
So, if government wants to do something, they have to reframe their policies. They have to really work hard and they frame the policies. We can't do things like this. Then we will give you a loan. You make a room with a with toilet, with a double bed, and make it a little away from the home. The district magistrates have told me that oh, these village homes are unhygienic, so we are giving them a loan for you know, a separate home. And the family that takes the loan will never be able to repay the loan. They will be caught in the debt trap. For debt to return, they have to migrate to the home. So the home stay is going to So these policies which we are making time and again, they are flawed. Government has a bigger impact. We have very small impacts. So when they make a policy, they, they don't consult anyone. They don't look at the ground realities. I don't think migration will stop if, if we keep doing such things. Yeah, yeah, we are all refugees in one way or the other. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Ashutosh. And uh, one question I would like to ask you is that uh, government uh, plays, I would rather say politics plays a major role in preservation of heritage. Like this one's very popular on the internet these days. Like, Mandariye Banega, that kind of thing. So I just wanted to know your views on how politics and religion, they play a role in the preservation of heritage. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. <laughs> ah, and the most dangerous one as well. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah. so uh, politics and uh, religion, you know, uh, many people say that we are a secular country and these two are separate. So, politics and religion is the same in India. There is no distinction between the two. They are part and parcel of each other. We can have a very long debate on this because I have studied this in great detail. Uh, maybe you can read my thesis and, <laughs> and, and uh, get my views on the debate. So politics and religion, yes, they play a very important role in preserving heritage. Unfortunately, in India, it's a religion which has hurt heritage the most. Like most of our temples, they are becoming bathrooms with shiny tiles, with chemical paint. Most of the traditional stuff is being destroyed because the temples have more and more money. <coughs> I was, I did a book called Upper Ganga Region and we studied all the temples from Harimar up to Badrinath and Kedarnath. We looked at each and every temple and documented it. I was shocked to find that all the MPs and MLAs, out of the development funds which are given to them from the government, uh, they can contribute money for uh, this temple Jirnodha. You know, so the first thing that they do when they get the, you know, one and a half crore or five crore bounty, the MP gets five crore rupees. So the first thing he does is, in his constituency, whatever temples he can find, he gives them money for uh, uh, for renovation. And um, so the Uttarkashi MLA very proudly in his, uh, when the elections came the last time, very proudly he made a film that these are the temples around Uttarkashi which I have renovated. And there were these old pictures of temples which were beautiful heritage sites. And then there were these new pictures, new, you know, videos of temples uh, with bright shiny bathroom tiles all over the place. So red and orange and yellow chemical, bright chemical paint, granite, glass, and anything anything that you can see. It, it, it's happening with mosques, it's happening with dargahs, it's happening with... <coughs> so it's happening with all religious sites and uh, uh, which are also heritage sites. So in India, you know, most of the heritage sites are religious sites as well. 
And when people get the money to preserve them, this is what they do because they are not sensitive enough. And so I wrote to the MLA and I went up to him and I talked to him and he started threatening me. <laughs> Uh, how can you say this? My people are very happy. They want this to happen. So, uh, money will not solve these issues. It's education that will solve uh, these issues. And people need to be sensitized about heritage. If we have the funds, the funds, again, they can work both ways. They can work in a very negative way also. And uh, in many of the sites, we have seen how religion and politics have come together to destroy the heritage sites completely. Uh, don't you think John Sabha was a good example of the mix of the three? Religion, politics and heritage. Yeah, I think all, all societies, all communities including John Sabha, the all three are commingled. Uh, you know, you cannot separate one from the other. Uh, ultimately, it's heritage and culture which wins people the elections. If you look at Uttarakhand, the whole state was a cultural construct. People fought for a different state uh, because they thought that their culture and their traditions were not being respected. And what do you have after the new state gets formed? You know, the story gets even worse. So, uh, you know, they are intermixed, they cannot be separated, and a lot of times culture and religion and politics comes together to destroy culture and heritage. But citizens only can change it, no one else can change it. Since you mentioned the orange yellow tiles, I have to force to compel to ask this question. You know, um, a lot of our aesthetics was derived from heritage. What do you think is happening with our aesthetics? Because when, like you said, when there is more money, something is happening to aesthetics. We are completely losing the script. We, we don't know what we are doing. We are building boxes uh, uh, in terms of homes. So I was, I, I tell this uh, very often, I was visiting the Taj with a, with a friend of mine from Germany. So we went and saw the Taj and uh, we came out and we came on the street where we had heaps of trash and, and the road had potholes. And very casually he said that your civilization it could do that so many years ago and you can't even build a proper road now. So what's going wrong with your civilization? So it was, I mean, for me it was a very, very sad remark that um, a civilization that could build monuments like the Taj or the Red Fort or the Minar or a Jetta and Loda or the and to build our homes the way we paint our homes, uh, you know, what, like pastries. You know, it's not a question, it's more of a dilemma. In sense of people like the tribal or the robberies, they have so much culture. And I don't know where my culture is from. It's a dilemma, you know, which we come across, which, like Jessica said, that it's the schools which have to educate us in our culture. Because I feel lost. If somebody asks me what's my culture, maybe ray and blue jeans. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, as much a responsibility of the school as much as it is of the parents. So I think the parents have to hold their kids' hands and introduce them to their own traditions and culture.